Welcome to the UC Riverside College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences 2022 Science Lecture Series on Big Data Science. My name is Madeline Haddad. I'm a second year math major and environmental science minor, and I am a CNAS Science Ambassador. Before we get started with today's presentation, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dean Catherine Yurick. Maddie, Maddie, before you go too far, I have to present you a little gift. Maddie is our most super awesome, super califragilistic, expialidocious <laughs> science ambassador because she's been with us for all four science lecture series. So thank you so much for your support. So welcome everybody to the 2022 science lecture series on big data science. But and more importantly, thank you for being here. Uh, people in person, people on, on Zoom, and particularly those who have joined us every Tuesday this April for the Science Lecture Series. We really appreciate it. Research at CNAS is truly changing the world around us. For our first presentation, Dr. Stephen Kane talked about the search for life in a universe of big data. Then Don, Dr. Thomas Gerke talked about big data for drug discovery and the human genome. And then last week, we had Dr. Mark Albert who talked about the impact of big data and how it helped to inform decision making for benefiting and improving human health. And today we have Dr. Francesca Hopkins, who will talk about interpreting, interpreting big data results and how those observations can help us reach our climate policy goals and ensure equity in the enactment of greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. So imagine, this is just four researchers in this month. CNAS has hundreds of faculty, hundreds of faculty, thousands, uh, if you include graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduate students who are all doing amazing research. And that is why UCR is ranked number one by the US News and World Report, number one in the United States for mobility, social mobility, three years in a row. And according to Forbes, UCR is one of the nation's top 12 public universities, top 12 public universities. And because we have the big uh, Riverside Bug Fair coming on Saturday, I wanna give a shout out to the entomology program, which n ranks number two in the world. So the science lecture series reflects all the incredible work our, science, our scientists, who include faculty, students, and staff. And I hope you have enjoyed the science lecture series as much as I have. And I'm looking forward to tonight's presentation. So before we bring up Dr. Hopkins, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's presentation, Dr. William Porter. Dr. Porter is an assistant professor of atmospheric dynamics and modeling in UCR's Department of Environmental Sciences. Dr. Porter and his group uses numerical and statistical modeling tools to better understand the causes and consequences of air pollution at both local and global scales. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. William Porter. Thank you, Dean Urich, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. It's a real honor to be here to participate as a moderator for this session. Um, and to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, as Dean Urich mentioned, my work focuses on studying uh, air quality and atmospheric dynamics. Um, and we do this using different types of models and simulations to, to kind of extrapolate from emissions into the, the atmosphere and look at where different types of pollutants go and, and how they might affect humans. Um, but it's a truism in atmospheric science, as with many types of environmental science that look at human types of human behaviors and how humans affect the environment, that the understanding of what happens in the atmosphere and looking at pollution and where it goes is built upon a platform of looking at what is being emitted into it. Uh, and for this reason, we depend on the, the foundational research um, that uh, Dr. Hopkins, our, our speaker tonight, performs to look at these emissions to better understand uh, what is coming from the surface and in particular how humans can influence uh, those types of emissions. Uh, in fact, greenhouse gases emitted by humans present the biggest uncertainty in how much global warming the world will face over the century. While the political will to reduce those emissions is beginning to be realized through laws to reduce emissions in California uh, and new global agreements such as the 2021 Global Methane Emissions Pledge, uh, 
new science and technology approaches are needed to verify the success of these policies. Uh, in this talk, Dr. Hopkins will describe new observations of the most important greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, from platforms ranging from mobile ob observatories to tower networks to plant sa samples to satellites. Along with new data systems to interpret these results and, to, um, and partnerships with stakeholders, uh, these observations can help us to reach our climate policy goals and ensure equity in the enactment of greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. Dr. Francesca Hopkins is an assistant professor of climate change and sustainability in the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, Dr. Hopkins is an environmental scientist studying the effects of human activities on the global uh, carbon cycle with particular interest in greenhouse gas emissions and carbon cycle feedbacks to climate change. Dr. Hopkins and her group use a range of techniques to measure emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutants across California, including from dairy farms, vehicles, and oil and gas sources. Dr. Hopkins is also passionate about communicating the science of climate change. She led the Inland Desert chapter of the fourth California Climate Assessment released in 2018. Originally from Sonoma County in California, Dr. Hopkins received her bachelor's degrees in environmental science and Spanish at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she studied abroad at the Pontifical Catholic University in Santiago, Chile. Dr. Hopkins completed her PhD in Earth System Science at the University of California in Irvine, and during graduate school also researched at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry in Jena, Germany. After receiving her PhD, Dr. Hopkins was a NASA postdoctoral fellow at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena from 2014 to 2016. And in 2016, Dr. Hopkins was recognized as one of UC Irvine's top 50 graduate and postdoctoral scholar alumni. Dr. Hopkins is also a busy parent of a kindergartner and a preschooler. And it is my privilege and honor to introduce tonight um, a colleague, collaborator, and friend, Dr. Francesca Hopkins. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here, and thank you so much, um, Will, for the kind introduction. It was really nice to, to hear that. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who's been here organizing it. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, um, from sources to space, how big data can help us manage greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and before I get started, I'd really like to acknowledge my collaborators and my group members and my cooperators and my funders, because without them, none of this work would be possible. Um, so here's a picture of my students um, out in the San Joaquin Valley doing field work, um, and they're really the ones who make all this possible, and um, I'm so lucky to work with them. Um, and you can see all the many funders that I've been lucky to receive funds from there, and I also have to acknowledge that um, I've had great collaborators and cooperators that help me get access to sites and understand data. Um, and so big data is really uh, requires cooperation of, of many, many participants. So climate change is really, to me, the big data challenge of our century. Um, this is a visualization that you may have seen before. It's the global temperature anomaly from 1850 to 2021 where the anomaly of each year, so the average temperature of each year, how it's different from the mean of the whole, is shown in a different color, with the blue color showing colder temperatures and the red color showing warmer temperatures. Now, this graphic actually was a huge data challenge to produce. Um, as you can imagine, the temperature records from 1860 to the present, there's many temperature records. They all had to be harmonized and they had to be bias corrected in order to understand what the true global temperature was over this time period that didn't include effects of too, too many effects of certain locations or urbanization or other things that were happening at the same time. And so it was really a huge effort for the creators of this at the Berkeley Earth Institute to pull together this data set. Um, and other scientists made this really beautiful this visualization that really helps us understand how the climate has changed. Um, over this time period. And so we have a great understanding of how the temperature has changed. And we also know that temperature changes are being driven by global, war global warming is being driven by greenhouse gases. And how much warming we can expect to have going forward into the future is going to be strongly dependent on how, what type of decisions we make today about how much more we're going to continue to emit going forward. So in this graph here, we have the temperature anomaly um, in Celsius from 1950 to 2100. And what you can see is we're really at this decision point right now 
where we can choose to make substantial cuts in emissions and um, minimize additional warming and just kind of level off, or we can just continue to emit at the rate we are now, um, no emissions cuts, and we can expect something like four degrees Celsius of warming um, without making a change to our emissions. So to me, this is really the, the data science challenge of our time. So how do we cut our emissions? First, in order to cut your emissions, you need to know what your emissions are now. So of course, you know, if you wanna lose weight, you need to weigh yourself and figure out how much you weigh so you can track your progress. And so a similar thing applies to greenhouse gases. Um, you may have heard of carbon footprint calculators. This is a way that you can calculate your own emissions. So here's the one from the US EPA. Um, and you can see that you're gonna put in information about your home energy, transportation, and waste to get your contribution to carbon emissions. Basically, what that carbon footprint calculator would give you is something called a bottom-up emissions estimate. Basically, we can estimate emissions by estimating activity, how much of some certain emitting activity takes place. So for a car, it would be like the number of miles driven, times an emission factor, which is how much CO2 is produ produced per mile. So this is what's used by government agencies like the US EPA. So over here on the right, I'm showing a graph of the methane emissions that the US emitted in 2019 by source. And this um, was developed by using these bottom-up techniques to scale up um, activities in each of these sectors to emissions. There are problems with this approach. There's incomplete activity data, and then these emission factors might not be representative of the total population that we're looking at. Another way we can think about emissions is by making measurements of the atmosphere. So here's the famous Keeling curve measured in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, where CO2 has been measured since the late 1950s. And here in this record, you can see that there's been a steady increase in CO2 over time. And I checked um, on the NOAA website today, and the CO2 level for today is about 417 parts per million, which is, um, more than 40% greater than what it was um, prior to humans emitting a lot of fossil fuels. Now, this is an important number to see how much CO2 has increased, but it doesn't tell us about the emissions that are contributing to it. And so in order to take an atmospheric measurement and convert it to emissions estimate, it requires very complicated calculations done um, to get an emission estimate. So essentially, you have a site like the Mauna Loa site where greenhouse gases are being measured. And then you need to understand how the winds are bringing the signal from the surface to that tower. Um, and then you can use a Bayesian inversion to convolute the predicted signal, what you think is being emitted with a scaling factor, to figure out how close your measured emissions are to this predicted signal. And so this requires a lot of data products. Not least of all, you need to have a very confident estimate of your wind direction and speed, which is probably the biggest shortcoming of this method. You also need to pretty much have a pretty good model of where the emissions are taking place in space in order to calculate this emissions estimate. So managing greenhouse gases is not straightforward because we have these two different approaches that are quite complicated to do, require a lot of data from various sources. And unfortunately, these two approaches often don't coincide with each other. They will often give different answers, which makes the problem even more challenging. So how can we make progress with greenhouse gas emissions? Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about three little vignettes from my research um, of ways that we can make progress on this topic. And they're all gonna involve use of big data. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about making the invisible visible. Greenhouse gases are challenging because they're invisible to the human eye. Um, and so it's hard to manage something, again, that you can't see or visualize. So making it thing, the emissions visible is one way we can help tackle the problem. Another thing we need to do is recognize that here in California, we're on the forefront of emissions mitigation strategies. And so we need to pioneer these approaches here and then try to scale them up to the globe to help us tackle this global problem. And then finally, I think we can really make progress by tracking emissions in our own backyard and really ensuring that our local environment reflects our values in terms of reducing CO2. So first I'm gonna talk about making the invisible visible. And so in particular, this is gonna be about visualizing fugitive methane. Talk about that in a second. So this is a really powerful image. Um, some of you may remember that back in October 2015, 
we had a very large blowout of a well at a natural gas storage facility in the Los Angeles area. It's in the Porter Ranch area. This place was called Aliso Canyon, and natural gas is stored underground for us to be able to use in the winter in this old oil field. Now, one of the wells in this oil field had an explosion, the casing broke apart, and a huge plume of methane was released, which you can see visualized here on the right. This um, infrared picture shows this you know, giant black plume of methane coming out, um, that, and it couldn't be stopped for months. So this emission kept going from October 2015 to February 2016. And all told, this release emitted 20% of California's overall methane emissions in just one event. And so to me, this is a really visceral uh, demonstration of how our use of methane in natural gas can be quite dangerous for our climate. So prior to this Aliso Canyon event, I actually knew a little bit more about this um, because new technologies, new sensors, have enabled us to make measurements of these invisible gases at a very high time resolution um, and with high fidelity. Um, these instruments can be put aboard a, a mobile laboratory, such as the one shown in the picture, so we can actually map out sources of these gases in the environment. And with these instruments, we can make measurements of the most important greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, as well as important air pollutants like carbon monoxide and ozone. So this is work I did as a postdoc at UC Irvine. And we took that van full, filled with instruments and we drove it all around the LA basin. And what we see is shown here on this map. The background level of methane at that time was around 1.8 parts per million, as shown in the blue colors, and then enhancements above that are shown in the more redder colors. And so what you can see is we have a lot of variability in methane in the LA basin. Some of that variability is associated with sources we, we know and understand that are emitting methane. So one example is we have the La Brea tar pits. It's a natural geologic seep that methane is bubbling out of the tar pits, oozing out of the earth. Um, we also have a couple of big landfills. So at the time, I made these measurements in 2013, the Puente Hills landfill was the largest landfill in the United States. It closed in late 2013. And so we consistently saw high levels of methane near that landfill due to the anaerobic conditions the trash was under, which is a well-known source of methane. Um, and then we also saw methane coming from the dairies that are located just to the west of Riverside near Chino. Again, methane is coming from dairy farms, and this is something we know and understand very well. But the more surprising thing is we saw methane hotspots associated with sources that are not currently being tracked by government agencies. And those included leaks in natural gas pipelines. Um, it included landfills that have been closed for decades that are still emitting methane into the atmosphere. And the most disturbing one is a compressed natural gas fueling station located in the of Long Beach. That was actually the largest single methane hotspot we saw in these surveys. And it's particularly disturbing because one strategy to clean up the, the port, to clean up trucking, is to switch from diesel fuels to natural gas as a fuel. However, if we don't do this well, it's going to actually cause global warming to get worse. So in this fueling station, large amounts of methane are essentially being leaked into the atmosphere. So that was really um, eye-opening to see those spatial patterns. And so after that work, I went to the Jet Propulsion Lab, where they have really great tools to visualize the invisible. They have airborne instruments that can see in the thermal infrared the places where the greenhouse gases absorb energy. They can be flown on aircraft, and they can survey large areas of space. And by retrieving that data and looking at the, um, the fine bands, that are collected by the instrument, we can understand where methane is in, when it's in high concentration. So the two instruments that I was able to use at the Jet Propulsion Lab is Avaris and Next Generation and High Test that work in slightly different parts of the infrared. And the way these work is that they're measuring many, many different wavelengths of, of infrared radiation all at once. And we know the place, the band, where methane absorbs strongly. So if you look at this image, when we go over a place that has high methane in the atmosphere, you'll see a change in the brightness temperature that corresponds to the feature where methane is absorbing. And we can use that to create 
a signal in our pixel of where that observation came from to show that methane is present. And so this is a really amazing technique, and it really allows us to cover huge areas much bigger than our LA survey, and in fact, to look at the whole state of California. So in 2016 to 2018, um, we conducted an airborne imaging campaign to look at methane point sources from all over California, focusing on the most important methane emission sources. We detected 564 strong methane point sources. And what were they? So these sources were found all over the state, and they were associated with many different sources of methane. Some of them are shown here. So all these little red pins in the middle figure are places where we saw methane plumes. We saw them coming from natural gas systems. So for example, compressor stations that, that compress the natural gas that's in the pipeline that's feeding um, the gas supply to your home. We saw methane plumes coming from oil wells, which we still have many active oil wells in the state. We saw leaking from not just compressed natural gas fueling tanks, but also from liquefied natural gas tanks. Um, and then of course, we saw methane from the expected sources of landfills, wastewater treatment, and dairies. In particular, we saw methane plumes associated with the wastewater treatment lagoons where dairy manure is stored and kept in anaerobic conditions and thus promotes the development of methane, which is then emitted to the atmosphere. So in total with this survey, we scaled up our findings. And what we found is that about 34 to 46% of the total methane emissions in California were accounted for by these point sources we measured. So this is really encouraging. That means that we now know all these places we need to go where if we can turn off the gas or we can turn it down, we can reduce our emissions. So I just want to show a few more visuals of some of these things because I think that this technique is so powerful. Here again is that compressed natural gas fueling station in the port that I described to you earlier where the green images are places where methane was emitted. So very clearly you can see that the methane is coming from the, the fueling station. We also saw methane coming from anaerobic digesters. So this is really important because the state has invested hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to deal with methane coming from dairy farms. And they've done that by creating these anaerobic digesters that are supposed to trap methane. It's supposed to trap the waste coming out of these manure lagoons. But um, in this case, in this image, you can see this big green plume coming off of a digester because that digester had a very, very big leak. And we saw it leaking many times. So in this case, um, actually visualizing the plume allowed us to see a problem that we didn't know was there before. So what is, what is the broader lesson here? So we have, we, we shouldn't probably use as much natural gas as we have, but we already knew that because it's a fossil fuel. But really, I think one of the things that is important to take away is that we're produ still producing methane from waste, and it's a great biofuel for us to use. But we need to be really careful in doing it, because anytime we have concentrated methane, biogas, there is always a chance it can leak. And so it's very important for us to use new measurements and monitoring to ensure that any leaks that happen are fixed quickly to prevent the emissions from going up into the atmosphere. And this is just a, a little video of a landfill where they're actually pumping the methane from underground straight to the atmosphere because methane wasn't really uh, considered important in this case. Okay, so visualizing fugitive methane. We learned that methane leaks abound in the urban environment. Anywhere where natural gas is handled has the potential to leak, whether it's pipelines, whether it's compressors, um, whether it's the storage facilities. And while biogas may be really great as a low carbon fuel, we really should be very careful to monitor and repair leaks to ensure that it's actually as good of a climate solution as it can be. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how some of the lessons we've learned in California can be scaled up to help us deploy solutions that can be applicable more, more globally. Um, and first I wanna talk a little bit about climate policy. So I've already mentioned that our future climate really strongly depends on our actions today. And this graph is from a report that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued in 2020 that was concerned with keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Is that something we can still do, is their question. And if that is something we can do, how do we get there? 
And so what you can see on this graph is from the warming that occurred from 1960 to 2020. It's shown in the gray um, with the average showing, shown in orange over the top. And then we have different possible future scenarios shown on the right going forward from 2020. Um, and you can see that, that line drawn across at 1.5 Celsius. That's a really important number because if our climate warms beyond 1.5 Celsius, it may trigger feedbacks that we don't understand well um, and make it much more difficult to control climate change in the future. So let's take a, a quick look at some of these possible ways to keep us under 1.5. Um, the first one I want to mention is the gray bar here, um, and that is basically global CO2 emissions, the most important greenhouse gas, needs to reach net zero by 2055. And we also need to do very substantial reductions in non-CO2 gases like methane, and they need to be reduced after 2030. And if we do that, we have a reasonable chance of staying below 1.5 Celsius. Now, those are really fast timelines, especially if you think of the non-CO2 gases. If we were to neglect to reduce methane, um, we have a much lower probability of staying below 1.5, which is represented by the purple curve there. Um, and if you look over on the right, it shows the, um, the range of possibilities that climate models expect for that level of emissions. But fortunately, last fall, the countries of the world came together and actually did make a pledge to reduce methane emissions. So to date, you may have heard about the Paris Accord. Um, if you look at what countries have pledged to do to follow through with the Paris Accord, it's nowhere near enough. Um, and so the next time that the Conference of Parties or the international groups that make these emissions agreements got together in 2021, they agreed that they would reduce methane levels by 30% towards this goal of limiting warming to 1.5 Celsius by 2030. And actually 105 countries agreed to this, including the US. And I think it's a really amazing victory if we can actually achieve it. Now there's some caveats. Um, Russia and China were missing from this discussion. So unfortunately, you know, these emissions are global, so we really need everyone to contribute. But um, I think it's still very hopeful, this global methane pledge. Now, California has been ahead of the curve. We actually had a law in our book since 2016, Senate Bill 1383, that said we need to reduce our methane emissions by 40% by 2030, so even more than what these other countries are pledging to do. So I think California is this really important proving ground to show that we can do this well. And so let's take a look at California's methane budget. This is something that I look at a lot. So we see our pie chart, again, made up from the bottom-up techniques of California's methane emissions from 2019. Um, so you can see we have landfills. They're about 20% of the total. We have industrial sources that includes those gas leaks that we talked about. But the biggest part of the pie is actually coming from agriculture. And in particular, dairy farms contribute about half of the total budget. Now, what's coming from dairy farms is split roughly evenly between methane emissions coming from manure management, so again, the, the poop basically goes into these um, anaerobic lagoons where it stays wet, it stays anaerobic, and produces methane. And then roughly the other half comes from cow's burps. You probably know very well that cow's burps are a major source of methane. And indeed, it's about a quarter of our total state's budget. And we do have quite a big and important dairy industry in our state. So the state is already working to shrink this manure part of the pie by putting in anaerobic digesters. And there's some really great work being done by UC Davis researchers and some dairy farmers to test red algae as a solution for reducing enteric methane, or the burps. But if we make these changes, we have to also be able to measure them and ensure that we're doing a good job. And so, again, this is something that we're investing in as a state. More than $200 million to date has been invested in dairy digesters from state funds, from your tax dollars, to construct around 100 methane digesters. Um, here's a picture of what they look like. So again, we have these um, lagoons where um, poop is stored and goes anaerobic. Basically, these digesters just construct more or less a tarp that captures the methane that's produced. So it can be cleaned up and put either back into the pipeline as a bio, biogenic source of natural gas that would, again, heat your home, or it can be used as a vehicle fuel. 
And if this project is successful, all these projects that have already been, um, many of them have already been put in place, it's expected to reduce current manure emissions by about 21%. But we also saw a few slides back that these digesters aren't perfect, they can leak. So it's really important that we have an idea of what the baseline emissions are to ensure that these digesters are actually reducing emissions in the way that we think they should. So surprisingly, when my group got interested in this, um, we found out that neither the EPA or CARB, the California Air Resources Board, that's charged with monitoring and um, measuring these emissions was, had any facility scale data about dairy farms. And this is really important because the digesters are implemented at the facility scale. So we really need information at that scale in order to ensure that these interventions are successful. So the first thing we did was we realized that we had to figure out a way to map out all the dairy farm emissions for the whole state at the facility level. And this wasn't easy to do because again, we, we didn't really have much to start with. And so one of my students patiently combed through the whole state worth of satellite imagery data, such as the one shown on the right here, and identified by eye the locations of all the dairy farms in the state. It's crazy that we had to do this manually, but that's what we did. Then we reached out to three different agencies that had some sort of permit data related to the number of cows per farm, and some of them had information about some of the manure management strategies that were going on there. And with painstaking work going through raw PDF data that of all these permits, uh, my group was able to build this map of dairy methane emissions at the facility scale for the whole state. So we used the number of cows from the permits, we knew the locations of the farms, and then we used emission factors that the state publishes to try to get an estimate of how much methane each farm was emitting. And this map here is showing what we got. Um, and you can see that most of our dairy farms, especially the high emitting areas, are in the San Joaquin Valley. We do have some dairies located in the North Coast and also in Southern California, like we saw in Chino earlier on in the talk. Another thing that we did is for the first time we tried to quantify the regional differences in manure management practices and how those affected methane emissions. And so I mentioned before that about half of emissions are coming from poop and about half are from burps. Um, that actually varies regionally. And this graph here is showing the ratio of the enteric fermentation methane to manure for the whole state. And what you can see is that in the San Joaquin Valley, the lagoon type of treatment predominates. And so we have about half and half from these two different sources. But if you look to the North Coast and also Southern California, we see that the emissions from manure are actually lower. The emissions from enteric stay pretty constant. It's really a function of how much the cow eats. Um, and so that is already telling us that there's an effect of these different management practices that are influencing how much methane is being emitted. So we're starting to link up the practices that are going on in these farms with the emissions. And one thing that's important to note, besides the fact that 90% of our cows are in the San Joaquin Valley, is that these type of big farms where the manure is mostly stored as liquid are becoming more common globally, especially in places um, that are uh, in the Far East and in South Asia. So that was a lot of work, and we were glad to have done it, but we were really glad when we finished. But a colleague of ours, we, we spoke with him, and he had thought of a clever way that we could use uh, artificial intelligence to actually make these maps with a computer. So we didn't actually have to go through and do all this labor ourselves. So um, what he did is he took our initial map of where the dairies were and how many cows were there, and he used a convolutional neural network to train an algorithm to detect dairy farms in imagery that was available from the National Agricultural Imagery Project, NAIP. And so what did, what did he see? So this is an example of what a dairy farm looks like. You can see that we have two different types of dairy farm housing here, and the algorithm recognizes those dairy farm housing and marks it in yellow in this image. And then the places where there's no dairy farm detected are shown in purple. Here's another dairy, it looks a little bit different. Again, we have the housing, and immediately the algorithm can pick up on that and shows it in yellow. And then we have our lovely manure lagoons over here on the right, which are shown in purple. So that's not included in this um, algorithm, just the places where the cows are standing. And then finally, we have another image here, some manure lagoons on top. We have some silage or feed kind of in the um, 
the right corner of the picture, and then there's a tiny bit of a corral, which again, the algorithm picks up quite well. So this is great because now all that work we did by eye can be done by artificial intelligence. And doing this work, we saw that the area of these cattle housing was highly correlated with the dairy cow population that we've collected from permit data. So now we have a way to relate the area that has been detected by this algorithm to how much emissions we think that each farm has. And in fact, the estimates of the emissions were quite similar to those that we came up with from our brute force approach. So I think this is a really promising technique going forward because there are new satellites that are being launched that can do the mapping of methane plumes similar to what we saw with the aircraft earlier. And that means if we know where to look, we can go find these dairy farms and we can try to keep track of their emissions and ensure that the countries that have these farms are in fact um, keeping good to their promises under the, the Global Methane Pledge. So here's some pictures of different types of dairy farms in different regions of the world that an algorithm could probably pick up on just like the one that I showed you just a second ago. Um, and we can go take a look in places where dairy farms are rapidly developing and keep track of those emissions that we currently don't have well quantified. So California is this excellent laboratory for developing these greenhouse gas ma management strategies because we're out there and we're doing it. It's something that we have under our law and it's enabling us to figure out these things so we can tell the rest of the world how to do it well, hopefully. Um, I think we can try to link our process understanding, what processes are producing these emissions with understanding of images that we have for the whole globe now. And I think that's a really promising way to help us better understand greenhouse gas sources. Um, and then finally, I think it's really critical that we verify that these mitigation practices that we're putting in place are, are working the way we intended them to. So we don't have big leaks coming from digesters that are gonna undermine our goals. Okay, um, and now I'm just gonna give one last vignette. I'm gonna talk about how we can track progress on decarbonization in our own backyards. And decarbonization, it's a big word, but basically our problem with the climate is fossil fuels. And so by decarbonizing, basically we're, we're talking about getting rid of fossil fuels as our main source of energy and replacing them with sources of energy that are not gonna emit um, and cause a climate problem. I also think decarbonization is an excellent opportunity for us to address environmental justice issues. So this is a map from the um, Cal Enviro screen that um, comes from the California Department of Public Health. And it's showing the exposure to diesel particulate matter. The places that have the more dark blue colors, you can see our, all our freeways and transit corridors are places where people are exposed to higher levels of diesel particulates. And diesel particulates are particularly dangerous form of air pollution. They're difficult to measure and they increase the risk of cancer for those who breathe them in. Now you might realize that the exposure to this air pollution falls strongly along economic, racial, and educational lines. So people who live closer to the freeways tend to be um, more disadvantaged in our society. Um, and this is important. In our region, transportation is not just the biggest source of air pollution, it's also the biggest source of CO2. And so by tackling our CO2 problem, our fossil fuel CO2 problem, my hope is that we can um, also tackle this environmental injustice that currently exists out there. Now, in order to really answer this question, we need information at a really fine scale, probably something like the neighborhood scale. So there's, in this case, we also have satellites that can help us. But in this case, I'm showing you how the satellite actually is insufficient to do the job. So this is from my JPL colleague, Florian Schwandner. Um, he took a look at the Orbiting Carbon Observatory and what it measured across the LA basin. And that's what's shown in the image on the right. So there are two different overpasses from two different seasons that are in slightly different locations. Places with the redder colors are places where CO2 was elevated. And then up in the Antelope Valley, we have much closer to background levels of CO2. And so these two tracks took place in winter and in summer. And what you can see is that up in the desert, the winter and summer is very similar and consistent. Um, but then when we go and look at what's happening in the city, we see a much higher enhancement of CO2 during winter compared to summer. 
And we think that's because there's a lot of vegetation around the Los Angeles area that is actually pulling CO2 out of the air in summertime during the photosynthetic period. And that actually brings the signal of about six parts per million down to about four. So this is another confounding factor. We can't just measure CO2 in the air to understand what's going on. We actually need to understand something about the processes it's coming from. But fortunately, we have tools to do this. And so now I'm going to show results um, from Cindy Yanez, who is an undergraduate student here at UC Riverside. She's now a graduate student at UC Irvine. We're still collaborating. And while she was here at Riverside, she started collecting um, a, a mobile sampling data set of CO2 along LA's roadways, similar to what I showed you with methane before. And now as a graduate student at Irvine, she's incorporated radiocarbon analysis of annual grasses that really helps us get at this question. And so all this work together, we've put together to really try to identify what were the fine scale changes to fossil fuel CO2 that happened during COVID-19. So I'm sure you all know back in uh, spring 2020 when this talk was originally supposed to happen, we were all at home and not out driving on the freeways. And so there was a very large reduction in traffic that happened. And we can think of that almost as an analogy to electrifying a huge percentage of our transportation because those cars on the road meant they weren't emitting CO2. So Cindy, again, before she left UC, UCR, she did some mobile surveys. That was in summer 2019. And then she repeated those surveys in summer 2020 and summer 2021. And so what I'm showing you here are maps of the LA basin with the CO2 excess. So we're subtracting the background and we're just looking at the enhancements above the background for the basin. And what stands out so clearly is that 2020 had much, much lower excess CO2 compared to the other years. And so why do we use this mobile technique for CO2? When we're on the road, we're only measuring what's coming from the other cars around us. And we're getting a really good mixed sample of what the traffic looks like. We don't have to worry about those biogenic signals that the satellite sees. And so putting all of her data together, we saw about a 60% reduction in on-road CO2 in July 2020 compared to 2019 and July 2021. And this was really cool because the tower, the tower networks that are around that are trying to measure CO2 did not see such a big difference in July 2020. They saw it earlier. But because we were on the roads, we actually had such a good handle on this, this source. Another tool that we've brought to bear on this problem to look at these fine scale changes in fossil fuel CO2 is actually to sample annual grasses. So here on the right, I have a picture of an avena, wild oat. These are plants that we see all over the place in springtime in Southern California, actually across the whole state. They're weeds, they're invasive, and I'm encouraging you in this talk to go out and pick them and send them to me so we can analyze their radiocarbon signature. And this is a really powerful technique because as those plants are growing, they're incorporating the CO2 they're exposed to in their biomass. And the radiocarbon signature of fossil fuels is very distinct from the background atmosphere because they've been tucked away in the earth for so long. And so it gives us a very strong method by which to identify how, much, how many parts per million of CO2 are coming from fossil fuels. So during the COVID-19 period, we started collecting these grasses um, along with my colleague, Professor Claudia Chimchik at UC Irvine. And we actually, again, it was COVID-19, we we're stuck at home. We asked citizen science volunteers from across the state to collect grasses near their homes and send them to us so they could be analyzed for radiocarbon. And here's what we saw. So this, we weren't the first people to do this. Um, there was a group who did this back in 2005. That's the image shown on the right. And they took a lot of samples. And here's what we got over here on the left. Not as many samples, not as many remote samples, because again, we just were relying on the goodness of people's hearts to send us samples. But we did see some interesting patterns. Not surprisingly, we see major fossil fuel CO2 inputs in the major urban regions of our state, the Los Angeles Basin and San Francisco. But it gets really interesting when we look more at the more fine spatial patterns that are embedded in this data. So we got data from 2020, and we asked people again to send us grasses in 2021. I'm asking you all to send me grasses now in 2022, if you would like to. Um, and we here, what I'm showing on this graph is the data that we got comparing those two years. 
So the color bar is showing the change in fossil fuel inputs in parts per million of CO2 from 2020 to 2022. And so the first thing you can see is that the redder colors are places where we have more fossil fuel CO2 in 2021 compared to 2020. And it's very interesting, we saw a much bigger rebound in fossil fuel CO2 emissions in the LA area compared to the Bay Area. But you can see that there's some much, many more spatial patterns here that um, are unexplained. For example, coastal Orange County is still very, very clean. There's still very little fossil fuel CO2 emissions there compared to what you see in near downtown Los Angeles. If we look over in San Francisco, there's some other similar and really intriguing patterns that can be seen um, that I think we do not have time to go into. So um, I think this is a great tool. If we know where these grasses grow, they can tell us something about the vehicle emissions that our people are being exposed to in that area. And if people can collect these samples and send them to us and we analyze them, we might be able to tell you something about how much vehicle pollution you're exposed to. And furthermore, as we go forward, it can help us figure out how well we can turn off the, the fossil fuel CO2. Okay. So I think, you know, to ensure progress and decarbonization, we need to involve the community and really try to link reductions in fossil fuel CO2 to air quality improvements. So to finish up, if you want to send me grasses, my information is on here. You can go to the website or you can send me an email. It's super easy. You just pick the grass and you stick it in an envelope and you send it in the mail. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, thanks again for the organizers. And I think now we're going to do some questions. Right. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Uh, at this point, uh, we encourage uh, any questions from members of our audience in person, as well as to continue uh, sending in those questions in the chat box uh, on Zoom. And so I'll start off just by asking if there's any questions from members of our live audience. Yes. So when would you use one over the other? It's a great question. Um, if you're the EPA or the California Air Resources Board, you have an idea of these activities that are going on out there that are creating the gases. And so you'll use those to build your inventory because you know about how much, you know how many cows are there in the state. You know how many cars are on the road and how much they're driving. And so that's the easiest way potentially to calculate especially if you have a confident emission factor. If you're an atmospheric scientist and you want to ensure that the state is doing the right thing, you're going to put up a tower, you're going to measure what's in the atmosphere, and then you're going to try to do this inversion study to figure out what's being emitted. And so the truth is somewhere between these two, and it's really um, challenging to figure out how to make them come together. But um, there's definitely cases where some are more appropriate than others. So if you're looking at one facility, for example, um, it might be more appropriate just to count the number of cows there. Um, it, de it depends on what your question is. But um, if you're, because it, you can imagine that like any system, there's going to be some variability. Um, among the different farms, they have different practices. So even for the same number of cows, the emissions may be different. And so I could, there, there may be reasons why you'd want to understand better how much emission a one farm has, and maybe you do a top-down study there, but maybe you really want to understand the whole region, and that's, I think, more appropriate setting for a top-down study. Thank you. And just to repeat that question that was regarding the advantages of top-down versus bottom-up estimates, uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat those for sure if we have any more in person. Any more from our, our live audience? Yes. So the question was on the algorithm for identifying the, the, the dairy farms, is that correct? Why the lagoons were not included as a method of identification? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we thought that the cattle, the places where the cattle live, the housing areas would be most closely correlated with their population. So in the future, should those algorithms go and look for the lagoons? Absolutely, especially as San Joaquin Valley style type dairies are found in other parts of the world. I think it's really important to find those lagoons. but. That was, we, that was just the first step, what you saw here. Thank you. And some questions from our chat. Um, one question, 
Um, in terms of mitigation, how can the anaerobic digester leaks be minimized? Uh, and what percent of our overall methane consumption or production uh, consists of those kinds of leaks? So the question, um, the leaks from the anaerobic digester systems, we don't know really at this point. So we have those airborne images that show the, plume, the plumes from these digesters. We know it, it's happened more than once at more than one dairy, unfortunately. Um, but we really don't have a good answer for that question. So my group is actually doing a very detailed study at one particular dairy farm that got one of these digesters. And we're trying to understand that question. And I think one thing that I didn't have a chance to talk about that I think is really important is the relationships with stakeholders. And so we've been really fortunate to work with the company that put the digester in and alert them to the possibility of these type of emissions. And I think they really want to be good citizens and they really want to make sure that these leaks don't happen. So I'm hopeful that going forward, as we have more and more technologies to actually measure methane, we can keep track of these emissions and not let them go unchecked. Thank you. Um, another question through the chat uh, is asking about uncertainties. Uh, what are the error estimates? How do we derive them uh, for these methane emission calculations? Oh, that's a great question. So that's a huge part of it. Um, there's uncertainties in everything. Um, and so I think we talked a little bit about the bottom up. So the uncertainties would be, um, you know, what does the distribution function look like for the emissions? Is it normally distributed? In methane, it's actually not. So that's going to be a huge issue. Um, we've seen that the data sets from the EPA and from CARB don't include all the sources, possible sources of emissions. So the activity data is not, not there. Um, in terms of quantifying the uncertainty, we we're, did a really careful job of that for the dairy farms. And we had some information about how many cows were on each farm. But of course, that was from permits that in some cases were decades old. So we, we tried our best to quantify the uncertainties in that sense by using multiple other data sets, including census data from the um, USDA. For the top-down measurements, the biggest uncertainty in that comes from actually the wind. We don't have good measurements of wind everywhere. And wind can be quite complex, depending where you are. So that's probably the biggest challenge we have with that technique. Thank you. Um, there was a question about um, opportunities to download and visualize and work with some of these data sets um, at home. Is there, are, what types of uh, open data might be uh, part of some of the data that you presented today? Yeah, so the, all the um, data that I showed from Avris, the airborne methane plumes, that's all freely available from um, the Carbon Mapper website. If you just go to carbonmapper.org, I believe, um, you can see all this data, visualize on maps, and you can actually download the, the data itself as well. Very cool. Um, a quick question related to the, the grass sampling data. Um, there was a question about the definition of CCF on those figures, what it stands for, uh, how it relates to the collection. Oh, I apologize for not uh, for using acronyms. Um, fossil fuel CO2 often is abbreviated FFCO2. So again, we know that anytime we measure CO2 in an urban area, some of it's going to be coming from the biosphere, from soils, from trees, and some of it is going to be coming from combustion of fossil fuels. Thank you. Um, here's a question about uh, the relative impact of methane and CO2. Um, what kind of benefits do you get from say burning the methane that might be leaking. You sometimes see this you know, when you have leaks from somewhere. The relative impacts of these gases on, on um, rate of forcing and, and climate change. Yeah, that's a great question. So methane is a much more powerful um, radiative forcer compared to CO2 on a mass basis. So we're really concerned about methane leaking because it, it, it is so powerful. And if we were to burn it and turn it into CO2, it has much less of an impact. So if you can flare off gas that is built up somewhere, that, that is a way to reduce its climate impact. But unfortunately, that also has air quality implications, which is why it's not practiced as widely as it might be in places like the San Joaquin Valley and Southern California. Um, let's see, any, any more questions from our live audience before we finish up with a, another question or two from the chat? Okay, looks good. Uh, a couple more questions here. Um, how worried should we be about methane from oceans? Is that a significant source that we should be interested in? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so there's been talk about these methane clathrates that are like methane stored in the deep sea that could be released from the Arctic Ocean. Um, 
I don't know a lot about that. And I, I tend to confine my thinking to land. I think there is a possibility that that could happen, but I don't think the data is very good. Um, I think what we have to be a little more worried about is methane possibly coming out of permafrost. So as the soils of the far north uh, that are currently frozen, as they start to melt more and more, it's going to create conditions under which methane can be produced. And I think that's much more of a worry. Got it. Thank you. Um, a couple of great questions here related to the same topic, which is uh, lots of interest in, uh, in community science and the use of, um, of community scientists in data collection and processing. And there are some questions about other types of opportunities for, for that in this work, um, and a question about whether you integrate that kind of work um, into any of the classes you teach. Great question, yeah. Um, I think I'm really interested in getting the community involved in collecting this type of data. Um, I was fortunate, actually, that I've been able to work with a couple different um, kind of like concerned citizen groups, um, including those that are trying to um, create better climate policy in the state, and then some that just, I worked with a group of people that had expertise on oil and gas, and they helped us go through imagery of an oil and gas field to understand what the infrastructure was there and what its purpose was. So I think there's multiple ways that community members can be involved in research. The grass is the easiest one. And then uh, one last question here. I think this is uh, a nice, relevant one for us working um, at a university. Advice for undergrad students to get involved with research related to the environment um, while learning these types of data science techniques. Great question. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to get involved in research. Um, I mean, probably the easiest way is to take a class um, with a professor who you think does interesting research. Um, but if you can't do that, you can also just um, contact them, and hopefully they'll have a spot for you in their lab. Um, often working with graduate students is a good way to get your feet wet and involved in that. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. And this is going to conclude uh, Dr. Hopkins' presentation. Um, I will comment just that to watch any of the Science Lecture Series videos, uh, feel free to visit sciencelectureseries.ucr.edu uh, or the CNAS YouTube page at youtube.com slash ucrcnas. Uh, thank you all for attending in person uh, or remotely, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.